Well, did y'all have a good Thanksgiving? I hope it was a Thanksgiving filled with good food, stress-free family time, and some winning football. And if you got even two out of the three, it was a pretty good weekend. Yeah, even my Cowboys won, which was unusual and surprising. Yeah. Well, it's hard to believe that we're already at the Christmas season, but we are. And so we're kicking off our Christmas sermon series, and I'm really excited. We're going really simple this year and going back to what is kind of more of a traditional calendar with an Advent Christmas. And if you know what Advent is, Advent means literally the arrival. And what we celebrate during the Advent is the arrival of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he came to earth in such a humble way 2,000 years ago. And so we celebrate that moment But we also live in expectancy for when he returns again. That's part of the advent. We're expecting his arrival again when he returns to us. And so as we think about that first Christmas, we think about the the really kind of unexpected and humble way that he arrived. I mean, he is God, he is king, he is Lord, and he arrived as a helpless baby in a dirty, smelly barn surrounded by farm animals. There was no royal proclamation. There was no big celebrations in a warm and comfortable palace. Instead, he came in humility to set an example of what it looks like. And then along with him came some gifts that we call the gifts of Advent. And so the gifts of Advent are represented by four of these candles. There's hope and peace and joy and love. And then there is the the Christmas Eve candle of Jesus himself when we celebrate actually the arrival And today we're talking about the first gift of Advent, which is hope. And that's, we've lit our first candle as we enter the Advent season. You may not know this, but during the construction of high-rise buildings, before they start building up, they actually start digging down. Because those buildings that go high into the air require a firm foundation. No matter how pretty that building is, no matter how tall it is above the earth, it's only as strong as the foundation that's laid. And I kind of feel that same way about hope. What we anchor our hope to makes all the difference for how we are going to experience these other Advent gifts of peace and joy and love. Anchoring our hope is important. Well, before we dive into our scripture for today, it makes sense to just start with an understanding of what hope even is. I think in society and modern culture, we kind of think about hope as kind of this just optimistic view of the future, like I hope my Cowboys will win the Super Bowl every year. Doesn't turn out all that well because that hope is not grounded in a very firm foundation, but that's what I hope. We kind of have this wishful thinking about what might happen. But as Christians, this worldly concept of hope doesn't even scratch the surface of how powerful this word is when we understand it. In its simplest form, hope is this. Hope is a confident expectation for what God has promised and a choice to firmly believe in God's truth. In other words, we have a hope in what God has promised. But even when we understand what hope is, here's the problem. It doesn't really come naturally to us. It's not something that just happens. And so we have to constantly preach hope to ourselves. We have to remind ourselves of the promises of God. We have to remind ourselves of who he is, what he's done, and what's to come. And and I will look at some of God's promises together in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 19 through 23, but I want to start, start with 19 through 21. Here is the basic promise of the gospel. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now, I want you to remember this first part because this is the the why. And then we're going to get to the response to how do we respond to this promise. But this is the promise of God. And the author of Hebrews here is contrasting our ability to be in the very presence of God, what he calls the most holy place, with that in the Old Testament before Jesus died and rose again. And he's saying through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross, we now have the ability to boldly enter into the very presence of God. And here's why. Because he became the perfect sacrifice through his blood so that no matter how we've messed up, no matter how many mistakes we've made, we are purified. We're made holy through that. And so we can now enter 
into that most holy place. And all of the Jewish readers who read this letter of Hebrews, they would have understood exactly the comparison that the writer is making here. He's contrasting the Old Testament with the New Testament. And so there's some imagery in there that would have rang a bell to them. So in the Old Testament, the, the most holy place was a place called the Holy of Holies. It was the innermost part of the temple in Jerusalem. And that little small windowless room was separated by this heavy curtain that probably was about four inches thick, they think, and probably weighed hundreds of pounds. And so this curtain separated the holy place where God resided with the Ark of the Covenant from the rest of the temple. And for 364 days a year, God's presence was in this room and mankind was separated from that presence. But on one day a year, the day of Yom Kippur, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would light incense and he would make what's called an atonement sacrifice to atone for the sins of himself and the Jewish people. But now it was a pretty big deal for him to do this because he went in there with fear and trembling because he was entering the presence of a holy God as a sinful man and his sins had not yet been atoned for. That's what he was going in to do. And so there was a lot of preparation to go into that room that one day a year. He would have to go through a ceremonial cleansing process. He would wear special clothing. He would have to veil his eyes. But even with all that preparation, he still went in there with a sense of discomfort because if he didn't do his preparation correctly, he would actually die. And God did this because he wanted to remind the Jewish people that sin brings death always results in death. And so this preparation was to prepare for that moment. And so because God is a holy God, he can't even stand to be in the presence of sin that hasn't been properly atoned for. There's actually a Jewish tradition, we don't know if it's true or not, but it's a Jewish tradition that says that before the high priest would enter into the holy of holies, go through that curtain separating the presence of God, that they would tie bells around his waist and they'd tie a rope to his ankle. And so when he'd go into the Holy of Holies and start making this atonement sacrifice, as long as there was a constant, you know, soft jingling of bells, everything was okay. But if they heard a really loud bling of the bells and then silence, they knew something had gone wrong and he had died in the presence of a holy God. And so they would take that rope and they would pull him out by his ankle because they couldn't go in through the barrier either because they would also die. So where the high priest had to enter the Holy of Holies with fear and worry, we get to enter with confidence because Jesus became the perfect and permanent atonement sacrifice for our sins. When Jesus died, all of that changed. His sins became a covering or a protection or an atonement. His blood became an atonement for our sin. All three of the synoptic gospels record that when Jesus died on the cross, that that big heavy curtain was physically torn from top to bottom. And so that physical breaking of the barrier between God and man represented the symbolic thing that Jesus had done. He had made it where every person who follows him can now be in the very presence of God. We now have confidence to live in God's presence. All right, so that's the, that's the why. That's the, the, here's what's happened. Now, let's look at how we respond to that in verses 22 through 23 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. So we have the opportunity to draw near. So draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. We're told to put our hope in this life into Jesus Christ. That's where our hope lies because he alone is faithful. And I love the writer of Hebrews says that we hold unswervingly to that hope. What is he saying? He's saying, don't get off track. Don't bounce your hope from this to that to something else. Keep your hope firmly placed in Jesus. Think about it like this. Imagine that you're like on this small boat out in some big massive lake, or maybe you're down in the bay in Galveston and you're out there fishing or riding around and suddenly this unexpected storm comes up. And man, the waves start to get high and dangerous and the wind starts to really push the boat and you can't control where you're going. You think about maybe trying to get back to shore, but you realize you're not gonna make it back to shore before the the worst of the storm hits. So you realize you're just gonna have to anchor out there and ride out the storm. But just as you're getting ready to drop your anchor to the bottom 
of the lake bed. You see this big branch or tree. It's bigger than your boat. Man, it looks stable. It looks, it's floating in the water beside you. You decide, you know what? I'll just tie off to that huge tree that's floating in the water and instead of anchoring. And so you tie off and you feel pretty secure because it looks pretty stable. But then the storm continues to blow and you are a little surprised that the boat keeps moving. And you realize that that tree that you've tied off to is floating in the water. And so it's impacted by the same storm that's impacting your boat. It's the wind and the waves are moving that around. See, the problem is you've not anchored to something stable. You've anchored to something that is affected by the same storm that is affecting you. When you're tied off to something that isn't stable, it's not going to really secure your hope. It's being pushed around by the same wind and waves. It gives you the illusion of stability, but it doesn't anchor you the way you hoped, and you can't find true stability. When you anchor to the, the solid foundation of the lake bed, you're finding something immovable that's certain and unchanging. And that is where our hope should be tied. If we tie our hope to things that are moving and affected by the same forces that cause us to need hope in the first place, we've missed the mark. I've actually watched this play out over the last few weeks, kind of as the election results have played out. And you could see some people who've really tied their hope to the election results. And so they've, they've lost hope in the future of our country. They've lost hope in the, the future of their family because they've tied their hope to a particular party or to a particular candidate. And, and the same thing happened to the, the other side four years ago if you did that. Because what we realize or should realize is that it's not stable. If you put your hope in our government, it's going to change. It changes with the whims of the American voters. You can't tie your hope to your government. You can't tie your hope to your finances. You can't even tie your hope to your family because you don't ultimately control how that happens. The only thing that is secure and stable is tying your hope and anchoring to Jesus because he provides stability even when the rest of your world is falling apart. Now, in this passage, we see two related but distinct concepts, and I want to show you how they kind of play together. We see faith and we see hope. Those are two distinct concepts, but faith ultimately leads to hope. Look at what faith is. Faith is complete trust and confidence in something or someone. That's how faith works. And then hope comes out of that faith. It's a confident expectation about the future that comes from faith. So to have hope, you gotta have faith. Let me kind of give you this illustration. Let's say I were to tell my kids that we're gonna go vacation at Disney World over New Year's Day. Not gonna do that, never gonna do that. But if I did, they would be really excited because they would know that we have this big vacation. The promise I'm making, if they believe it, and they would, that's faith. They have faith in what I've told them, the promises I've made. And then because of that faith, they're going to have hope in a really fun time over New Year's Eve at their favorite vacation spot. That's the interplay between faith and hope. The verse is saying because we have faith in Jesus, because he is worthy of our faith, because his promises are secure, because of that, we can have hope about the future. We can have hope in this life even when things are going difficult for us because we know he is with us. And we can have even greater hope about the future to come in heaven because we understand his promises about eternity if we follow him. But see, here's where so many of us mess up when it comes to this Advent gift of hope. We do exactly what this writer of Hebrews tells us not to do. We swerve. Instead of focusing on Jesus, anchoring our hope to him, we begin to anchor our hope to things of this world and we kind of bounce from thing to thing looking for hope and it fails us. And the problem is, they're all moving targets. They're ultimately going to let us down. Pastor and author Tim Keller wrote a book called The Gospel in Life, where he talks about different idols that we have. An idol, if you know, don't know what that is, an idol is just simply anything that we put in God's place at the throne of our heart, at the very top of our priority list. And typically, what you put at the top of your priority list is where your hope is going to be anchored. You're going to anchor your hope to that. And so what Tim Keller says is that so many of the sins we think about are not really the problem. They're symptoms of a deeper problem. So things like greed and anger and fear 
envy, bitterness, and worry, and lust, and selfishness, that those are just what he calls surface idols. They're actually not the real problems. Instead, they're just symptoms. But Keller says below that, below those sins that are at the surface, is something that he calls source idols. And these are the things that drive our other sin struggles. It's where we put our hope so often in these idols, and then it destroys our hope when these idols fail us, which they definitely will. Here are these four source idols that Tim Keller talks about. Comfort, control, approval, and power. And we'll talk about each one of those. But these things can work individually, or they can work in concert or connection with one another. And what happens is we begin to anchor our hope to those different things, and then ultimately, they let us down. They give the illusion of stability, but they're affected by the same uncertainties and changes in this world that make us need real hope in the first place. All right, this first source idol is comfort. And that's a big one for us here in Katy, Texas, because we live in the suburbs. And the suburbs, it's all about comfort. That's why it was created. We live close enough to the city so that we can drive into the city and make a big city living. But we don't have to deal with some of the big city problems. We live close enough that we can drive in and we can shop and we can go to the restaurants we want to and shows and all of those different things. But then we get to drive back out of the city and conveniently and comfortably live in more of a neighborhood feel with better schools. There is, a, there is an allure of comfort and convenience about the suburbs. Let me, let me show you how far we've come with this idol of comfort. So we've decided that fast food drive through is too much of a hardship. I just We can't do that. So now we have app-driven curbside service. And look, I get how difficult drive through is. I mean, my goodness, you've got to order with words. I mean, you got to talk, and it takes that effort, and it kind of wears you out. And then, not only that, but then you got to pull up, and you got to pull out a credit card or something, and you got to give that to the person. Then you got to, you know, get your food, and you got to reach out again. And sometimes that's at two different windows. So you got to give your credit card at one window. Then you got to drive up to the next window and reach out again and get your food. Man, that's a hardship. And so what we've done is, we said, because that's so difficult, we now have app-driven curbside service, so you never have to use words. You don't have to pull out a credit card. It's all done, and then somebody just walks it out to you. That's comfort. Look, we, we all want to live the good life. We all want to be comfortable. And there's nothing wrong with being comfortable until that's where you anchor your hope. But once you anchor your hope there, you've turned it into an idol. This comfort idol says, I want what I want, and, and I want it right now. And that desire is what keeps credit card companies in business. But here's where this source idol of comfort gets us into real problems. Comfort fails us when life becomes less comfortable. And it will become less comfortable. See, if we've anchored our hope to comfort when things get uncomfortable for us, it's all of a sudden going to fail us and we're going to start to lose hope. Minor inconveniences begin to feel like major hardships. Normal life problems cause us to struggle with depression and anxiety and worry. But see, Jesus never promised us an easy life. That's what we miss. That's not one of his promises. He doesn't promise us that. But what he does promise is that he'll never leave us and that ultimately heaven is in store for us. So if we've anchored our hope to comfort it's, that idol is going to fail you when life gets tough. And, and look, this isn't the only problem that this idol of comfort causes. It also causes us to want to live safe lives. And so we don't take chances. We don't get outside our comfort zone to live lives of meaning and to further the kingdom. Because goodness knows we want to be comfortable. And getting out of our comfort zone is just the opposite of being comfortable. A number of years ago, we went on a mission trip with our family to Uganda, Africa. And it was a great trip. And we were there two weeks, and we got back, and we would tell people about our trip, and people would tell us how brave we were. And I was a little surprised by that. And then we had a couple of people that told us that we were a little foolish to take our younger kids to that part of the world. And, and I guess I get that, but if we'd have stayed in our comfort zone and hadn't taken a little risk, we would have missed one of the best amazing things that we've ever experienced as a family. Some of the faith of some of our kids has been formed by that. Some of our kids understand that life in Katy, Texas doesn't look like life in other places in the world. And so when we talk about those things, they understand it. Look, it wasn't a comfortable trip. We learned to use pit latrines. If you don't know what a pit latrine is, it's a hole in the ground. So that's what we learned to go to the bathroom in. 
our motel, it was not a five-star resort. It, uh, it had water that you couldn't get near your face when you washed because if you did, bacteria would potentially make you sick. We had a high fence around where we stayed with a, a guard with an AK-47 at the front gate. I don't think it actually worked. It was so rusty. I think it was more of a status symbol than an actual tool for his use. But it wasn't comfortable. It wasn't a five-star resort. If you were giving out stars, I guess it would be zero, or I don't know if you can give out negative stars, but if you could, it would have been negative stars. There was no swim-up pool bar. Now, there actually was a pool, but it was nasty and green and algae, and you, you didn't want to get in it. It wasn't a comfortable trip, but it was awesome. See, comfort could have kept us from that amazing experience in being a part of God's kingdom. We had a life, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But our quest for comfort and safety, it so often keeps us from taking chances and getting out of our comfort zone to experience the fullness of life that God intended. So let me ask you, is this idol of comfort where you've anchored your hope? Do you spend a whole lot of your life trying to make yourself comfortable? Do you not take chances and get out of your comfort zone because you just want to be safe? You just want to make sure that your comfort is protected. And the, the frustrating thing about this idol of comfort is even when you're comfortable, you worry about losing that comfort. And so even in that moment, you're not getting some of these other gifts of peace and joy because you're worried about your comfort being taken away. So I want to give you some simple tips to try to move your anchor from this idol of comfort back to the Jesus that it was intended to be anchored to. So what I would tell you is, Make yourself a little less comfortable to develop your relationship with Jesus and to serve him. Here's some practical ways to do that. Set your alarm clock 30 minutes early in the morning. I know, I know. Get up and do some Bible study and prayer rather than getting a few Z's. See how you're making yourself a little less comfortable to get a relationship that's closer with Jesus. You can also begin to serve Jesus in ways that are a little less comfortable. Maybe instead of coming to church just one hour and then disappearing out, you come one hour and attend worship service, you serve the other hour. Maybe you save some money by not eating out as much or going out for entertainment or buying so expensive coffee and you use that money to give back to God. You can also get out of your comfort zone by offering to pray with people at work or inviting your neighbor to come to church with you. You can connect with one of our mission partners. Man, we have so many opportunities of ways that you can serve other people. We have a homeless mission that you can be a part of. You can be, be a part of our ministry to single moms or at-risk veterans. Where some of our guys are starting some prison ministry, and you can be a part of that. Make a point to be a little less comfortable to honor and serve Jesus. And that begins to move your anchor from that idol of comfort back to Jesus. All right. The second source idol where we so often anchor our hope is control. You struggle with this issue of control or this idol of control if you just really want to control the world around you and you want to change the people in your life to be more like you want them to be. And this was a big one for me. Man, I love to feel like I have control over something. Uh, I, I'm much more comfortable in traffic if I'm driving than I'm sitting in the passenger seat because I have the illusion of control. And here's how this works in more serious situations. We think that if we do the right things, that we exert control over our future. And here, let me give you some examples of the way that we do that. We buy insurances for every possibility that we can think of that might happen. We have savings accounts. We have retirement funds. We have investment portfolios. And look, all of those are good things. There is nothing wrong with any of those things until that's where you anchor your hope. Because you start to think that you control your future, and you don't. I can't tell you how many times I've seen where people think they have control that when it gets down to it, they don't. I saw another example just in the last few days of a, a couple that had been preparing for retirement. They had a plan of exactly how things were going to work, and they've spent years getting ready for this moment. And about a year before the retirement... One of them got sick with a bad disease, and now they're three, three weeks away from retirement, and their future looks completely different. And if you're not careful, if that's where your hope is tied, you're going to lose hope. When we worship this idol of control, we also want to control the people around us, and I've done that too. 
When my wife and I first got married, I thought, man, if she would just do what I want, the way I want her to do it, everything would be great. We would have joy in this marriage. She just needs to listen to me. That that didn't work out as well as I thought it was going to. And, And that may be what you're trying to do in your marriage right now. But instead of bringing peace and joy into your relationship, all you're doing is creating a toxic environment in your home. Here's the difficult reality that we all have to come to grips with. And the older people are going to understand this more than the younger people are. We do not have a whole lot of control over our future. We just don't. We're weaker than we think we are. Things change and we don't have any control. There's not a single one of us that can't have our happiness shattered by a phone call in the middle of the night about something that's happened to a family member. There, there's not one of us that cannot be just struck when we get a test result with a bad prognosis. We don't control the future. And so if we put our hope in this idea of control, this idol of control, it's going to let us down and it'll rob us of our peace and joy. And again, here's the crazy thing about this idol of control. Even when we have control, we're scared to death of losing it. And so even in those moments, we don't have peace and joy because we're worried about losing the control we think we have. But then when life pulls back the curtain and shows us how little control we actually have, then we lose our joy because we put our hope in something that can't last. Where you put your anchor, what you anchor to makes all the difference in how you experience these Advent gifts that we'll talk about over the next few weeks. Maybe your source idol is approval. And the approval of others really matters. You you just want to be liked. You just want people to, to, to like you for who you are. And so you worry a whole lot about what you say and what you do. And you're constantly worried if you're getting the level of affirmation and approval from other people that you think you deserve. Man, this is a dangerous idol because we begin to think that our self worth and our value and love is tied to how much approval we think we're getting from the people around us. You forget that you have incredible value as a child of God, even when you're all alone. You forget that when nobody likes what you're doing, God is pleased with you as his child. You are worthy of love. But so often if you've tied your hope to that, you don't even think you're worthy of love unless you're getting the level of affirmation that you think you should. It's gonna constantly have you worrying and being self-conscious about how did I deal with my family? How did I deal with my friends? How did I deal with my coworkers? Did they like what I said or what I thought? Some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about because this is your idol, approval. And you're constantly trying to earn the love and earn the approval of people around you so often at the expense of the approval of God. And look, this is a sneaky idol because it can sneak up on you even if you don't struggle with it normally. This is not an idol I struggle a lot with. I struggle with some of these others a lot, but approval is not generally where I struggle. But it can sneak up on me if, if I'm not careful. I, I used to have like no social media accounts, no Facebook, Instagram, any of that. And I just didn't care. I, I didn't think people wanted to know what I had for dinner last night, and they don't. And let me let you in on a little secret. They don't even care what you had for Thanksgiving lunch. I know it's shocking, but they don't. They had the same stuff you did. But I didn't really care, so I didn't have one. And so my friends from college and high school, they would tell Lil, hey, get him to get a Facebook account so we can you know, communicate with him. Well, finally I did, but I, but I never really posted. But then when I became a pastor, I realized that social media has an impact, that social media is a great way to, you know, communicate with lots of people at one time. It's a great way to make connections. And so I began to post at that point. And suddenly I began to care what people think about what I posted. So if I posted about a sermon from the last Sunday and lots of people said they liked it and man, they talked about it and they were you know, posting or sharing it and saying, this was a great sermon. I preached a great sermon. But if nobody or just a few people commented or, or liked it, I wondered if I'd even preached a good sermon. And I started to tie my approval to what was being said on Facebook when I posted something. And look, even today, I catch myself, I look at churches that have bigger congregations, have more people attend on Sunday, or they have their own buildings where they can do cool things, or a pastor that's more connected in the community or has more social media followers. And I can start to wonder, are we doing the right things? What could could we do different? And, And I forget that I am not judged as a pastor 
in how many people attend this church. I am judged by my obedience to God. And I forget that sometimes. And sometimes I can be even a little jealous. This approval idol can get the best of you even when you don't expect it. Can I, can I be really direct with you for just a minute? If you worry all the time about what people are saying about your Facebook and Instagram post and how many likes you get, you need to get off social media for a while until you can beat this idol. Because you are putting your hope in the wrong place. You are anchoring to something that's not even real. Let me be honest with you. Your friends on Facebook, they're not your friends. You don't make friends by clicking respond to friend request. You do that by common experiences and good communication. Don't put your hope for approval in social media. The approval of others, is, it's, it's tempting, but it's fickle. This is where your hope is anchored. You're going to constantly struggle with the affirmation of others because no matter how much response you get, you're always going to want a little more. It's never going to be quite enough. It's a moving target. It's like that big log that's traveling right along with you in the lake. All right. Here's the last source idol that we so often anchor to instead of Jesus, the idol of power. Now, before you discount that one and go, I don't really struggle with power, let me tell you what it is. It is wanting to win. It is wanting to be successful, be successful in your job, in your family. It is putting so much hope in those things that it becomes where your hope is tied. You just want to win. You want to win the card game after dinner. And then because you put your hope in success, when you come up short, you lose hope. You begin to be discouraged and depressed. And and even when you're having success, you worry about the success being taken away. You worry about losing that power or that success. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Or is this one just me? Because this is a big one for me. I, I, I say that I don't care that much about winning, but man, I sure hate to lose. And it's a joke, but it's really not because I worry a whole lot more about losing than I do about winning. I'm scared to death of losing. And so even when I have success, I'm not enjoying the success because I know it can be taken away from me. And and then when I fail, if I'm not careful, I lose my peace and I lose my joy because I've lost this sense of power. Look, there is nothing wrong with wanting to be successful. That's a good thing until it becomes where you tie your hope. Does that make sense? All of these things can be good things until you anchor your hope to them and then they become an idol. So how how many of you guys have ever failed at something big? Anybody? Yeah, whether that's a marriage or a job or a business or some big project or an adventure, failure is a part of life. It happens. And look, if we're going to live lives of adventure, lives of, of, you know, worth and value, We're not going to win every time. We're going to have some setbacks. And if you haven't experienced failure, at some point you will. But here's the beauty of our Christian faith. Our Christian faith gives us the freedom to say, look, I'm weak, but God is strong. I can't always win, but he will win in the end. There ought to be freedom in that when we tie our hope to Jesus. We are not defined by our success or failure. We are defined by our faithfulness and obedience to God. Look back at verse 23 one more time. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises is faithful. It's saying don't don't get off track. Don't anchor your hope to the wrong thing. Don't anchor your hope to power because you're going to fail on occasion. Don't don't anchor your hope to comfort because life is going to be uncomfortable at some point in time. Don't anchor your hope to approval because it's fickle and it will fail. And don't anchor your hope to control because the reality is you don't really have any. Put your hope in Jesus. He, He is faithful even when we are faithless. He still comforts even when comfort fails. When control slips away, he still sustains. When approval vanishes, he still accepts us and loves us. When success eludes us, he remains. See, these source idols, they demand everything from us and they give us nothing. But Jesus gave us everything before we even knew who he was. So in this Advent season, we celebrate this birth of Jesus on that first Christmas and we live in expectancy of his return again. 
let's anchor our hope not to the shifting sands and the changing things of this world, but to the immovable rock of Jesus Christ because he alone is faithful. He alone will never fail us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, how do we just put our faith in you, our hope in you? Because when we put our hope in you, you are worthy of that hope. God, just as we celebrate this Thanksgiving and this transition into the Christmas season, remind us of where hope is truly found. Not found in the, the, the moving things of this world, but it's found only in you. God, I just pray that we would all just analyze what is that area? What's that idol that we hang on to? And God, you would help us begin to move our anchor to you. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen.